The winningest team in baseball also has the most saves, and people who save the most money are winners. So start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only $10 each. These bonds earn a fixed 7% APY, and there's no fees, penalties, or minimum balance required, and they can be redeemed whenever you like. You can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save and save and win. This is Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. Well, welcome to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I am Janelle King, and this topic is something that I kind of stumbled upon, and I thought it would be necessary to talk about it, mainly because of the fact that there are lots of young families that are out to, out, out here now. Um, a lot of people are raising children in this technological era, and... Um, it's just interesting, right? As you, as you know, when new things come into play, it comes with a lot of different stuff. It comes with its own set of challenges, its own set of everything. So, um, so let's just let's just dive in a little bit and um, let's discuss this topic. <laughs> I know you're wondering, like, what is she talking about? But you know, as adults, we are faced with so many topics today, um, topics that we never thought in a million years that we would be discussing or that would ever be an issue. I mean, who knew that cross-dressing and drags, drag queens back in the day would morph into this whole new transgenderism and this whole new space of just discussing transgenderism? And who that social media when it first came out will become something that is so lucrative and uh, would create an entire new industry which is now called like the influencers who knew that that's what would come from simply sharing your pictures and what you got going on and what you're eating for breakfast I mean and then who knew that advocating um, for social justice or advocating in general would turn into this whole social justice warring era and now we're looking at all of these DEI trainings that are just impacting the world I mean I pulled up at a university here in Georgia and I saw a sign that says like reserved for the vice president of diversity equity and inclusion and I'm just like what but anyway that's another topic for another time but who knew who knew that this is something that we would all be facing? These are topics that we'll be talking about. I mean, most of us can honestly say that we had absolutely no idea. But there's a common denominator in all of this. And that's what kind of led me down this little bit of a rabbit hole that I'm going to take you all on with, with me. It kind of it led me to the, the common denominator out of all the topics that I just listed and all these other topics that are coming out. And it's our children. I feel like it's our children that are taking the brunt of the negative effects of a lot of this, these different topics and a lot of these just different issues. And as adults, you know, we completely understand that these things are wild and crazy. And, you know, it's a little bit outlandish and sometimes a lot of it outlandish because we had this remember when factor. We remember when times were different. We remember when times just seemed to be a little bit more normal. But for our young people, this is their reality. This is their life. This is they don't have a remember when for some of our young people who are growing up right now. And innovation had led us into this world of technology where technology is king. I mean, it is, it is king right now. Through TikTok, more and more of our young people are now identifying as fluid or a part of the LGBTQ community. And yes, I blame technology because it's information being spread so quickly and not just being spread quickly, but it's, it's and not that just, you know, that it's at your fingertips by being on your phones. 
But it's targeted. So if your young person is even confused about anything and they go to social media or Google and everything is so interconnected now that if they type in Google, I'm confused about my sexuality, then they're almost always going to be sent this targeted, targeted information. And we're seeing that when it comes to the whole LGBTQ movement. A couple of stats, because I love to have some statistics whenever I talk about these things, so people know that I'm not just spewing my opinion. I'm, I'm sharing information based on things that I've discovered. So I don't know if you know this, but approximately 15.9% of Generation Z adults, these are adults that are around about the age of 18 to 23 now, identify as LGBTQ. But in more shocking news, a 2018 report was done by the Williams Institute at UCLA that found that 27% of California youth aged 12 to 17 identify as gender non-conforming, which includes those who identify as gender fluid or non-binary. And another survey, and if you thought that was, was was bad enough, there's another survey that said, that was conducted by the Trevor Project in 2021, this is the most recent survey that found that 42% of LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24 identify as non-binary. That's almost half of the LGBTQ community ages 13 to 24. That's almost half of that group identifies as non-binary. They, they feel that they have no gender. They'll wake up and feeling however they want. Well, we're not talking about the LGBTQ community, but I want to make sure we understand the impact of what is happening through technology, particularly through social media. And due to social media likes, being an influencer now has replaced the need for ad space on several different marketing budgets. I mean, there are a lot of companies that are just saying, you know, to heck with, you know, uh, commercials on TV or any other type of platform. We're now going to just pay an 18 year old to go out and wear my dress in a cute way and post cute pictures. And that's now going to get it. And I mean, look, kudos to the businesses, because I'm pretty sure it's a lot cheaper. At least I would think it is, although there are a lot of influencers who are being paid millions and millions and millions. Millions of dollars. So, you know, give or take a few. It depends on where you want to spend it. But it has changed things. And due to information spreading faster than the speed of light, you have DEI trainings, as I stated before, that's taking place all over the country and all over the world. And it has it's 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 putting us in a position now where it is changing the meaning of everything. I mean, now everything is now labeled as racist. And I'm just thinking, what on earth is happening? What is going on? And let's not forget the fact that if you have a mob formed, and due to social media, mobs can now form in seconds. You are now controlling every conversation from public safety to how you are supposed to see yourself. This is impactful. We cannot, we can't hide from it. We just have to now accept that we are living in a very unique space. And who is really suffering through all of this? Our children. That's what I said it before. It's our children. It's our kids. This is their life. You know, I was thinking, I I saw um, a girl, a young girl walking down the street and she had on like a really, some really, really short shorts and a little crop top. And, and I was just thinking to myself, like, man, my mom would never have let me wear that out. But I also remember that while those things existed, it wasn't the standard. It wasn't the standard. Um, Girls would dress in all kinds of ways, but 
I don't know. They're just the standard was you wear whatever your mom and dad approves. Now it's mom, dad, if you don't let me do this, I'm going to be bullied, either virtually bullied. My social media is not going to do well. I'm going to lose followers. I mean, it's just the conversation has changed so, so much. But there's a greater concern to me. Even beyond, you know, having to deal with the the whiny teenager, which we thought we've all been through, there's even a there's a bigger concern. And I just think that we're producing some extremely anti-social, risk adverse, and entitled adults. And that is a scary combination if you really think about it. And the hardest part is that even though you may be the parent that's doing the absolute best to shield your child from all of the harm that's that's coming and that's readily at their fingertips. What about the unforeseen problems? What about the unforeseen issues that may present itself later or may be present right now and disguised under an incorrect diagnosis? I bet that was a twist that you didn't think you were going to get. <laughs> so the, everything I said, everything that I talked about earlier, it's leading up to the main topic of today's show. And I really think it's important to dive into this topic. And you're going to see why. And you're going to understand a whole lot better by the end of the show. However, it's really important to talk about some of the diagnoses that are coming out that's affecting our children and how technology is a culprit. Technology definitely plays a role. And what's interesting is that it's not so much the TV as much as it is your devices, your other devices, your tablets, your cell phones, that's really affecting your children in a different way. And it's not just the content. So today we're going to explore a behavioral diagnosis that's associated with our youth. It's it, it's growing at an alarming rate and it's doing it right under our noses. And a lot of us are just not prepared. We're not paying attention to it. Um, it's affecting mostly our toddlers, which is also probably a twist. <laughs> But this, this diagnosis is affecting ages, they say, zero to four toddlers. And it's something that is just really impactful. So I want you to join me on this journey as we talk about a very important topic called virtual autism. There was a time where a there was a mother who noticed that her child who can speak who can communicate started speaking only by utilizing one word so in other words the child would come in the room and say hungry to mean mom I would like something to eat or TV which means you know put on something for me to watch (laughs) um you know, outside, et cetera. So the child was just speaking in and using one word to communicate what they really desired. And they didn't exhibit any type of social skills or any type of social interaction. Like a good mother, this mom went and she took her child to a speech therapist and was, you know, afraid that something might be wrong or there might be something that's really concerning going on. And then the therapist ended up diagnosing the child with autism, which would make sense given the the behavioral signs and symptoms that this child was exposing uh, or I'm sorry, espousing. And so the mother felt like, oh, my God, something is really, really wrong because I had no idea. My child is now I think the child is like around three. And this is the first time I'm seeing this. I thought the child was going through normal development up until maybe a year ago or so. And 
it was concerning. But her toddler really was showing these signs and it just didn't have much of an explanation. So the mother started doing some research and she came across an article by a Romanian psychologist, Marius Zamfer. Now, if you're Romanian and I'm pronouncing that absolutely wrong, blame it on my American accent. But um, we're going to call him Dr. Zamfer. It's spelled Z A M. F-I-R, if you want to do your own research, Marius Zamfer. And this psychologist coined the term virtual autism to describe the screen-induced syndrome. Now, virtual autism is being seen in children ages zero to four at alarming rates. And let me give you some more data to show you how alarming this is. So in 1980, one in 2,000 children were diagnosed with autism. Given the fact that, you know, autism was kind of being a, it was something that was being early, you know, discovered and it, it just, it wasn't that big of a topic back then. I'll give or take some of these numbers. So let's move up to 1990. So in 1990, when autism was kind of taking effect, one in 500 children were being diagnosed. Fast forward to 2010, and it's one in 68 in 2010. Fast forward to 2020, and we're at one in 54. One in 54 children, child, children are being diagnosed with autism every year. That is alarming statistics going from 1 in 500 or 1 in 2,000, depending on how far you want to go back. Something is happening, and once again, our children are taking the hit. So before I dive too deep into this, let me just kind of start with the top of, like, what is autism in general, for those who may not know? Autism spectrum disorder, ASD, is what virtual autism now falls under. And it's a neurological disorder that includes a spectrum of behaviors where children with ASD typically have difficulty communicating and interacting with others and or having social or understanding social cues. They have very narrow interests in spending hours doing repetitive tasks such as moving objects um, from one place to another or seemingly just moving them around just without purpose. The autistic child lives in his own world, isolated from his peers, and some engage in the virtual environment as a substitute for reality. So you know how we have like virtual, like the the, the whole uh, virtual reality world and then the metaverse is coming out with something and all that stuff. There's some kids that just kind of live in that space in their heads. And so virtual autism is this new phenomenon and there's some doctors who don't even recognize it. But there's been a lot of studies. But it's a new phenomenon And when I did some research, I found it quite interesting that in America, it just hasn't really hit here. It's really big now in Romania because of this doctor. And it's kind of spreading internationally. But it's it's something that I just don't think that we should pass up. I mean, the hard part is that most parents have no idea that they're harming their children in this way because it's so easy to do it. It's so easy. And there's a lot of parents who just have no idea that handing their child a device at a young age can even cause autistic-like behavior that can be easily misdiagnosed. But it's not so much the device or even the content It's about the screen. It's about that blue light. Now, when you watch TV, it's a little bit different because, for one, we're further away. We typically are not just staring directly into it. Um, But the blue light that's in our other devices can be extremely, extremely detrimental to brain development. And we just didn't know that. But studies are showing that a child's brain at any age is developing. 
And heavy exposure to screens is increasing the risk of autistic-like symptoms, even attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD is what we most we know for it's short. But there are new studies that show how children who spend a lot of time in front of the TV or sitting there staring directly into the TV or computer, phones, tablets, develop this new type of autistic spectrum disorder and autistic-like behaviors. But then they saw that, you know... This is causing these children to go into this almost induced screen coma <laughs> that is 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 causing these re- these behavioral re- behavioral effects. And that's why they call this phenomenon the virtual virtual autism. So what is ha- what's happening when your toddler is staring at a screen? Well, according to Dr. Zamfer, he said that I call it autism because it has perfectly identical symptoms. Symptoms of autism include a lack of social reciprocity, a lack of visual contact, a lack of language development, lack of play, and especially social play. And in case the autistic child who watches TV or their, their, their tablets or screens get inadequate stimulation, there is a lack of psyche, motor, and sensory stimulation, so the neurological system does not develop properly. So in other words, by staring at the screen, watching TV, you're causing the, the child's psyche, their motor skills, their sensory skills are just not developing the way that they should. And there's a study that was done by by the Romanian Autism Center for Children that showed that 90%, 90% of two-year-old kids are diagnosed with autistic-like behaviors triggered by watching TV. I thought that was quite interesting. So they were able to do this study and show that there's a large, I mean, 90% of the two-year-olds that participated in the in the study did show autistic-like behaviors that they believe was triggered by the screen. And they're saying TV, but in America, and I'm not saying this is not the case in Romania, but in America... I'm seeing more and more toddlers holding tablets. And this is not an indictment on the parents. Um, You know, we'll get into to that because I don't want this to be a bashing parents for, you know, giving their children something to keep them busy. But you just want to make sure you understand the effects of long term screen use on your children. So. I asked myself, could this explain the enormous increase in the autistic and the ASD diagnosis? And I just have to say that I really think so. I think that we're now from we've gone from one in 500 kids to one in 54 because of the fact that we now have so many children that are staring at screens. I mean, I think it's silly that we're even allowing kids to have phones while they are in school. I mean, I'm thinking that the phone used to either be put away, and I'm sure a lot of teachers do that and, and, and require that. But I am I am here for taking phones. Everybody throw your phone into the basket when you come into the room. And then once you, you know, throw your phone in there, you can go sit down. You can go participate in class and do everything you need to do. Um, but then you get your phone when it's time to leave. I'm all for that. But, you know, I don't know. Call me old school, whatever. But how do you know that your child is showing signs of virtual autism and not other forms of of autism? Because that was the big discussion, right? It's like, how do I know the difference between virtual autism and classic autism? And the best way to do it, according to my research, the best way to determine whether or not your child is dealing with virtual autism or classic autism is to to just take the device away. Like, put your child on a device fast for about a week 
and do not um, let them have it, no matter how much they fight, screen, pull, and uh, see if they start to show themselves coming, kind of returning back to more interaction and, and human and interacting with humans a little bit different and better social interaction. Because the same study that I mentioned before that was done in Romania, it showed that when parents remove the devices from the child, the symptoms subside. And I thought that was a really, really, that's encouraging to know, especially when you're talking about children that are such a young age. But some symptoms that are very unique to this, but it's also very unique to the classic autism, is uh, hyperactivity, inability to pay attention, a lack of interest in play activities apart from the whole like virtual world. So I'm talking about like, you know, play activities that are outside and, you know, being a normal kid, speech delay, a lack of social interaction, irritability and mood swings, and then decrease cognition. They, those are the key elements, and I'm going to say them one more time. It's hyperactivity, inability to pay attention, a lack of interest in play activities, speech delay, lack of social interaction, irritability and mood swings, decreased cognition. These are key symptoms that they say to pay attention to. But as I stated before, placing your kiddo... On timeout from the screen is probably the best course of action. But that being said, I'm often reminded and I think about our latchkey kids. And it's funny because I was talking to my producer about this. And, you know, my husband was a latchkey kid. And a lot of people who were born in the, or consider themselves to be Generation X kind of grew up in the latchkey kid era. And... You know, my husband talked about how he would come home, you know, fix himself a little sandwich, <laughs> and then he'll sit in front of the TV and watch. Um, I think I may have added the sandwich. I think it did tell me that, though, but we'll find out when he hears this. <laughs> but I know he did say he came in and he was sitting in front of the TV and watched PBS. And to this day, my husband's very much so into animals and nature. He knows a lot about a lot of animals. I mean, a lot. And I find that to be quite fascinating. But that was what he did. However, it was done at a time where his mom and grandmother was not home or wasn't present. You know, they were. she was working and he was, you know, being a latchkey kid. But there was still other interaction. There was still more personal interaction that was taking place. And so I want to make sure that we kind of dive into that piece a little bit um, as to what can we do to reverse this? What are some things that we can do to incorporate in, that we can incorporate in that will kind of counteract the the effects of what's happening with the screen. Um, and I thought I want to have my closing remarks too. So all of that is coming up. And I do know that when we continue to go down this path, when it comes to technology, when it comes to what is happening in the world, I am not anti technology. I'm not anti the use of it. I know there are a lot of discussions around AI and chat GPT and all this other stuff that's coming out. I just know that there has to be a discussion around the effects of new innovation and new development. There has to be a conversation around how is this going to impact the world around us and how is it going to impact our young people because if you're looking at a stat like like that uh that that uh what well let's start here if you're looking at the data the data points that came out in the Romanian study that showed that 90% of the two the, the, the children that they were um, targeting, little small toddlers, that 90% of them were uh, showing signs of virtual autism. That means that we're producing adults 
that will also have social negative social impacts, negative social effects. And I really think it's important that we highlight that because I believe that years from now, these kids are going to be deeply affected in so many ways. Um, If you don't know how to interact with each other, that's going to be a problem. And to be honest, I remember when text messaging became a thing and that was a conversation that was being had I know around me, I don't know around others, but it was just that we were losing the conversational piece. We're losing what it meant to interact with people. I mean, we, we've we moved away from eating dinner around the table to now eating dinner in front of the TV. Like, everything happens now around the TV. The TV is now the centerpiece at dinner time. But I want to end with some tips, some tips to help detox our children from the impacts of what is happening and just to be able to focus in a little bit on how we can reverse this issue. So here are some tips. I researched some doctors that are specializing in this, and I feel like we're going to see more and more doctors put a lot of energy, a lot of time into specializing in this particular topic. So, however, I really want to make sure that you are equipped in case you are one of those moms or dads that is happy is utilizing the screen as an option to, you know, keep your children busy um, while you're doing other things. And like I said, there is no attack on you because I get it. We're living in a different day and age. And uh, we'll get into that in the closing arc and our closing remarks. (laughs) So here's a few tips that you can take with you in order to detox your children. Number one, first and foremost, take away the screen take it away completely or you can start by reducing their screen time to under four hours a day Um, over four or more hours a day is just way too much for a child to be looking at the screen and I know we're all like that's a lot of time but if you think about it let's just think about it right if you The child wakes up, you get them ready for school. While you're getting ready, they're sitting at, they're eating breakfast, staring at the TV. And then they're in the car and mom has a conference call. So I need to put you on your tablet. So you put the headphones on and the child's now on the tablet all the way to school. And then they get in school. That's their interaction or preschool. Let's we'll say preschool or um, daycare because this is these are toddlers. You get them there. And next thing you know, you know, it's time to pick them up. They're back in the car. You have a couple of conversations. You get them back home. It's time to fix dinner. So then what do we do? Put them in front of the screen. I mean, we are looking at probably about two hours already, and we haven't even gotten to the end of the day. And in most cases, they haven't even gotten to after their homework when they can watch TV. So, you know, just I don't know, like, just think about it from that perspective. Try to, number one, first and foremost, limit their screen time to under four hours. Next make eye contact on their level if possible. So just, you know, getting down on your your kid's level and having conversations with them on their level through eye contact. Read to them. And this doctor suggests that you start reading to them as early as six months if possible. And that seems early, but that's what the doctor says. <laughs> um, and not all doctors, you know, we don't we don't listen to all doctors, but I think that's a good point. Also, talk to them about everything. This doctor suggests that we talk to our children at every moment, at every time. While they're eating, what are you eating? How does it taste? Do you enjoy it? Are you having fun while getting dressed? Do you like this dress? Is this a good color? What is this color? While grooming, by walk them through during bath time, like we're washing your arm now and now it's your foot. And being very interactive during every aspect of their growth. 
Another suggestion is to eat together but not in front of TV. So move, remove the TV and just sit at the table and eat together. Another suggestion is, and probably most importantly, to give, probably the most important, I should say, give the child a chance to respond. If you're having conversations, don't respond for the child. Like, don't put words in their mouth. Just kind of allow them to interact with you. Ask questions that will have them, in turn, respond back to you. So in closing... I would just have to say, I really don't think that there's anything sinister going on. I don't. I think that with new innovation comes new challenges and new discoveries and new things. And I don't, I think there's, it's a good thing that there are studies that are showing that you can reverse these effects. I think that's even more important. Um, And then to moms, dads, grandmas, caregivers, everyone, do not beat yourself up because times have changed. You know, times have changed and there are a lot of parents who are working and who have been working. And there are a lot of parents who are um, who 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 are in households where both parents work. So that would mean that. You know, there's times when you do need that extra break. And I think that that's important. That's understandable. So don't beat yourself up at all. You know, quiet time is very slim these days. (laughs) So putting that device in their hand might give you a little bit of a break. But you do have to remove the device at some point. And while you're going through this process, I'm not saying to do it do a complete withdrawal because that may or may not be the case, but most certainly make sure that you are tracking how much time you're putting, you're, you're putting the screen in front of your child. Just balance it out. Make sure that your babies are getting every type of human interaction they can get in real life, not in the metaverse as much as possible. Just ensuring that they are having that human interaction is extremely, extremely important. And um, yeah, let's support these studies. I was disappointed when I saw that there wasn't more talk about this happening in America, particularly where we are being extremely inundated. I don't know if you know this, but the TikTok that's in China is not the TikTok that we have here. Um, The TikTok in China is definitely more educational. It's more focused on teaching them about the government. It's more focused on teaching kids how to be prepared and more successful in life. Rather, over here... It seems like they're really targeting kids on these a lot of these emotional issues, superficial issues and things like that. So it's important to know what's going on. Um, even when we have these devices, because I don't trust the commercials. I had someone call me and said that um, there was a commercial that came on after our Georgia Gang show would air on YouTube and it was just inappropriate but that's not something that we had to control over but I did let the team know however that's something you might want to think about too while your kids are watching these these shows so let's continue to support these studies let's continue to support our, our, our neighbors our families it does take a village and we have to keep that in mind But virtual autism is out there, and I happen to think that I'm seeing it in adults, too. Maybe we'll talk about that another time. (laughs) But I think I see it in more adults than I am, you know, I want to. It's quite concerning. But I hope this was helpful. I hope you gained something from this episode. I hope somebody can go and take this time to look and think about whether or not they are spending too much time with the device and allowing their children to be on that device. So thank you so much for listening to Let's Talk About It with Janelle King. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, the rest of your week, and I will see you 
next week. The winningest team in baseball also has the most saves, and people who save the most money are winners. So start earning saves by investing in worthy bonds for only $10 each. These bonds earn a fixed 7% APY, and there's no fees, penalties, or minimum balance required, and they can be redeemed whenever you like. You can even round up everyday purchases to buy additional bonds. Go to worthybonds.com backslash save. That's worthybonds.com backslash save and save and win. Spring is here and baseball is back. You can't forget the Derby. I love the hats. Do you have yours yet? My hat? I treated myself to a whole outfit. If you want to be able to treat yourself, then you should check out the Nest Savings Account at LGE Community Credit Union, where they want you to reach your savings goals faster. Take it from a pair of 680 The Fan Wives. Head to lgeccu.org to find out what makes their team number one in Georgia. So, Robert, I want to thank you for your time. I just don't think you're the right person for this position. I don't understand. Was it something I said? Well, we did a background check on you and found some things of concern. If you're in charge of hiring for your company, you know how helpful a background screening can be. That's why companies that use Horizon Background Screening make smarter hiring decisions. Don't let the wrong hire put your company at risk. Get the real story on your candidates at horizonscreening.com. Horizonscreening.com. 